Hello guys and welcome to TGN the Game Nerd the Show where I talk about Opal Games and today we're going to be playing 9 Hours, 9 Persons, 9 Doors. In the last episode, if you don't remember, we went ahead and did a lot of skipping through dialogue. Since we got our first ending in episode 14, episode 15 was just kind of spent getting back to a point where we can make a new decision. We went through the four door again and we did pretty much everything we did before, but now we're finally going to get to a new decision. That new decision is us going through door 8. I... I think I'm gonna go with door 8. Okay, 8 it is. Yeah. Alright, then that means June's gotta go through 7. What? Why? What? Santa grimaced and muttered angrily to himself, but finally began to explain. If the six of us are gonna keep going without leaving anyone behind, there's only three ways we can do it. Plan A. Go through 7 with 358, and go through 8 with 467. Plan B, go through 7 with 457, and go through 8 with 368. Plan C, go through 7 with 367, and go through 8 with 458. And that's it. Those are our only options. In other words, 3 and 4 and 7 and 8 can never go through the same doors. You get it now? Santa finished, June looked over at Junpei, tears welling up at the corners of her eyes. Oh no! You're saying we aren't going to see each other again for a long time! Junpei felt just as June did. He wanted to be at her side through whatever trials they were preparing to face. But he knew if they were going to survive, he had to swallow his feelings. In order for the six of them to move forward, he and June had to be separated. He looked at June. He was scared to lose her, but he swallowed steeled his resolve and did his best to smile. Hey, come on, you're making that sound like we're never gonna see each other again. We gotta split up, but only for a while. This is just like when we went through the four and five doors, remember? We got split up too, but we all met back up. I bet seven and eight are just like that. You mean they're connected somewhere? Yeah, probably. Probably? She didn't sound very hopeful. It was seven that interjected. I'm sure they're gonna connect somewhere. Why? What makes you think so? If they don't connect, neither team could get through door 9. In other words, the game would end right here. Zero's been on top of his shit so far. I don't think he'd blow it now. I'm damn sure that son of a bitch wants to have his fun as long as possible. He's not gonna end this game until we get through the 9 door. June said nothing. The tears were gone, but her eyes were still sad as they looked at Junpei. He met them, and with what reassurance he could manage, laid his hand gently on her shoulder. Everything's gonna be fine. We're gonna see each other again. I promise. June bit her lip and gave him an almost imperceptible nod. Yes, promise? Her voice was barely above a whisper. Santa's voice shattered the moment. <sighs> you guys are done, right? He stretched and continued. Anyway, that's pretty much it. Clover and I will both go into separate groups. I'll f I figure I'll tackle seven and Clover can, ta can take eight. Any problems with that, Clover? Clover looked away and was silent for a moment. Whatever. It was more of a dismissal than an agreement, but Santa didn't seem to care. All right, we're ready to go then. Let's move. So pretty similar as before, just with the opposite stuff. We're still going with uh, Clover either way, obviously, because if we're going through 8 with Lotus, Lotus is 8, which means we need to, if two other people are going through, they need to make 9. And so if Junpei is going in, then Clover is going in as well. Same math can be done for the other door. At Santa's command, the group split and headed for their respective doors. Santa 7 and June walked toward door 7 while Clover, Lotus, and Junpei headed for door 8. For a long moment, they stood in front of the door. Then Lotus laid her hand against her chest and turned to Junpei and Clover. Are you ready? Yeah. Yes. Then shall we go? The door had opened. A narrow hallway stretched out before them. Lotus and Clover leapt through the door. The moment they did, their bracelets beeped. The detonators in the bracelets had been activated. Junpei stepped forward to follow them. But as he was about to step over the threshold, he stopped. He looked to his left. 
toward door seven. June stood there, a mirror image of Junpei. She turned and looked toward him. Their eyes met. They nodded. Their farewell took almost 1.5 seconds. And then someone took hold of Junpei's arms and hauled him bodily through the door. He heard the sound of the numbered door slam shut behind him. His bracelet gave a cold electronic beep. 81 seconds left! Hurry! Lotus snapped at him and ran to the dead. Junpei and Clover followed her as fast as they could. Phew! It stopped! With a shaking hand, she wiped a few beads of sweat from her forehead. Clover, however, was calm. Aloof, perhaps. Pointless. She muttered to herself, without emotion, and began to walk down the hallway, leaving behind a confused Junpei and Lotus. Lotus watched the girls receding back with a mix of frustration and curiosity. What an unpleasant girl. I bet she's not very popular with the boys. Her sarcasm seemed a little more biting than was perhaps necessary, but she sighed and started after the younger girl. After taking a moment to catch his breath, Junpei followed. The hallway made a number of turns before at last coming to a dead end. Set into the wall on the left side was a large iron door. For a few minutes, they stood in front of the door, examining it. Above the door was a plate with the word laboratory engraved on it. A laboratory, huh? That doesn't sound very pleasant. I don't like the look of this place. Me either. But there aren't any other doors. It's not like we have a lot of choices. Junpei. Huh? Please, you first. Junpei suspected her politeness was motivated by something other than respect. Gah. Junpei muttered to himself and pushed open the iron door. His first steps inside were tentative and careful, but as he examined the room, it became clear that there was no imminent danger. Lotus followed him in, and Clover brought up the rear. The room they found themselves in was divided into two separate areas by a curved wall. A thick glass window built into that wall made it possible to see into the other side of the division. Junpei walked to the window and looked through. What the hell? Wasn't sure what else to say. In the center of a room shaped like a quarter circle, a mannequin lay on what looked like a medical exam table. That looks so creepy. Junpei jumped a little. He hadn't noticed Lotus come up next to him. You... you... don't think that thing is going to suddenly... sit up or something, do you? Well, I don't know. I mean, look at all those cables sticking out of it. We pressed the wrong button. I don't know. Stop it. Just thinking about it is terrifying. She was gripping her arms, the knuckles on her hands white. It was then that Junpei noticed Clover. She was still standing near the entrance of the room. Her face had the appearance of calm, but it was drawn and somehow sad. There was something almost pitiful about her. Junpei walked over to her and, as kindly as he could, spoke. Are you okay? Clover looked away. What are you talking about? What? What? I'm just worried about you. You've been real quiet. What? I can't be quiet if I want to? Well, I mean, of course you can. I just... Okay, then. If I can be quiet if I want, just leave me alone, okay? Come on, you know I can't do that. We gotta work together. Clover bit her lip and was silent for a moment. Then suddenly, Junpei, you just don't get it. Her cry took Junpei by surprise, and he stumbled backwards a few steps, alarmed. My brother's not the kind of person who just leave me behind! Something happened to him! Something... something bad! Junpei had nothing to say. Lotus, jolted from her mannequin nightmares by Clover's voice, turned toward them. What happened? Clover's eyes slid to Lotus, then back to Junpei. Look, just don't bother me, okay? Leave me alone! Finished, she turned around. Before Junpei or Lotus could say anything, Clover had begun to walk quickly away. Hey! Wait, Clover! Hold on! He might as well have been talking to a wall, for all the notice he took of his cries. 
Not even slowing down, she made for a doorway cut in the wall in front of her. Without even slowing down, she passed through the doorway. And without warning, an iron gate fell from the ceiling like a portcullis, sealing Clover in. What the heck? What's going on here? Clover grabbed hold of the iron bars and shook them as hard as she could. Hang on, I'll get it open. Junpei grabbed the bars and pulled. In a moment, Lotus joined him. The three of them pulled as hard as they could, but... Ah! Ugh. Grah. Damn it, it's not moving. Wait, are you just gonna give up like just like that? No, I'm not giving up. This has got to be another one of Zero's puzzles. If it is, then there's got to be a way to open it. Junpei nodded. And just what I was thinking. Now all we got to do is find it. Lotus and I can look around here. Clover, you're going to have to see if you can find anything in there. Oh, yes, I'm on it. One of the most interesting parts about uh, stuff like this is that you get to see all of the different puzzles that other characters were going through. Like, currently at this moment, uh, June, Seven, and Santa are uh, experiencing like the mannequin over there and, uh, you know, doing the stuff with the liquid. Uh, it's, it's really cool. If we go ahead and look in here. Uh, there are a few things that we can go ahead and look at. There's the obvious mannequin over here on the left, but if we look on the right here... I don't know what kind of table this is, but part of it's all black. There's a pin lying over here. I think someone probably used it to make the table black. Hmm. Well, if they only used the pen on one part of it, there's probably something underneath all that pen. Clover, do you think you can erase it? Yeah, sure. Oh, this is a permanent marker. Junpei, do you know how to erase ink from a permanent marker? Erase ink from a permanent marker, huh? Just give me a minute, Clover. I'll be right back. Alright, moving away from here, uh, making our way over to the left side. Uh, right here we have... There's a lot of stuff here. I don't know if we could... I don't know how we could use any of these. Hmm. Well, I can say for sure that I do know how to use at least one of these things. Which one? The one on top. I think it's a power cable. The power cable, huh? I'll take that. Three-pronged power cable. This is definitely a power cable. Do you remember if we ran into anything that didn't have power? Not yet. A power cable. Maybe I can plug it into something. Uh, if we move over to the left, uh, we have a computer, which that doesn't seem to have any power since it's currently off. But more importantly, we have some lockers right here. We can open one of them up and we get ethanol. Ethanol. I wonder if this is for antisepsis. Oh, it says anhydrous ethanol. Anhydrous. Is that different from the regular ethanol? Come on, that's common knowledge. Anhydrous ethanol is a powerful cleaner. It can even erase markers left by a per it can even erase marks left by a permanent marker. Hey! Did you know that ethanol is used in some alcoholic drinks? So does that mean you can use booze to clean up marker graffiti? Well, I don't know about that. I'd rather drink it than use it to clean. Uh don't drink that. <laughs> I'm not gonna drink it. <laughs> a bottle of an anhydrous ethanol. Apparently it can erase marks of a permanent marker. So we know what to do with this. Let's go ahead and let's see if I can if I can click on something here. Clover, use this ethanol. You should be able to wipe off that permanent ink with it. What am I gonna wipe with? Oh well your clothes, of course. <laughs> kidding, just kidding. Please don't look at me like that. You're scaring me. <laughs> so uh, you can pass stuff through the bars to Clover and then guide her over to uh, specific points by looking through the window. Uh, Clover, can you use the cloth on the table? Use... huh? Soak it in ethanol and then use it to wash off all the stuff from the permanent marker, okay? Right, okay, so I gotta soak the cloth with ethanol. Well, she's got the cloth, but she seems to be having a little trouble with the bottle of ethanol. When she's ready, I should ask her to get to work on the stuff on the table. Soak the cloth in ethanol and... Junpei! It's working! It's wiping the permanent ink off! Huh? There's some kind of weird drawing under all the permanent ink. What's the deal with that drawing Clover found? Maybe I should ask her to take it, take another look at the table. 
I wonder what this is. There are a bunch of numbers in some kind of grid. I can't see it from here. Clover, you've got a pen and a notebook, right? Could you write those numbers down and then hand them to me through the bars? Okay, Roger. So we move back to the bars. Here, Junpei. I wrote down all the numbers from the desk on here. Paper with numbers on it acquired. New material added to the file screen. Let's go ahead and check it out. I will say it's kind of weird um, seeing Clover act all normal and stuff like that after the previous ending that we saw. Because uh, this is all, like, before that, obviously. So it's nice to see her, you know, back to normal. So we got Clover's note. The note Clover copied from the stand in the, oh, in the laboratory. It has four numbers written in nine separate cells. So... One in the bottom right, two in the top right, three in the top left, and four in the middle. Let's keep that in mind for later. Anyways, we still have to uh, worry about the three-pronged cable. Uh, if we head over to that computer that I was talking about earlier, the monitor doesn't have a power cable. So, one end of this cable needs to be connected to a monitor, and the other end needs to plug in under the desk. Alright, let's just slip you in. Huh? Well, shoot, I can't use this. What's wrong? The cable has three prongs, but the socket only has two holes. Uh, it's not going to fit in, is what I'm saying. In other words, we're going to need a plug to change the power cable to, to one with two prongs. That's right. Uh, so we can't do anything right now with that. So once again, we're going to move back over to this window, and I'm going to see if I'm going to see if I can click on this. Hey Clover, how are the power cables over there? Huh? What do you mean? Does the plug have three prongs or two? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Let me go look. I guess she does have to kind of crouch down to get a look under there. The cable on the monitor has, uh, it's got two of those little metal things. What does that mean? That's it! Okay, can you unplug that cable and bring it over here? Uh, okay, but... But? Well, I can unplug it, but it's connected to the main computer. I can't take it over to you. Damn it, that's no good then. Well, how about just the plug? What? The plug? Well, maybe more like a, uh, connector? It's the sort of thing that makes the plug with the three metal thingies into a plug with two metal thingies. Still useless? Not useless! Not useless as- not useless at all! That's just what we were looking for. Okay, can you hold on for a little bit? And back down she goes. Alright, unplugged. I'll hand it to you over the bars, okay? Once again, we make our move over to the bars. Here you go, the two-prong plug. Thanks. Okay, put the two-prong plug onto the head of this power cable. Got the two-prong power cable. It fits perfectly. This should be just what we need. This is the power cable with the two-prong plug attached to it. This should do the trick. So now, go all the way back over there. Actually, I can just move over one space. I didn't even need to go all the way around. Alright, I've got the two-prong power cable in my hand. I'm pretty sure this will work. Under the desk I go. Let's just plug this thing into the monitor. Alright, this ought to do it. Alright, let's turn the power on. Uh, I don't think anything's going to happen. Why not? Well, it's not connected to the main computer. You never know until you try. Pretty optimistic. Junpei pushed the button on the front of the monitor. With a soft hum, it turned on. Streams of letters that made no sense to Junpei began to scroll across the screen. He had hoped it would turn on, but he hadn't expected... this. Huh? It's actually working? So it would seem. Uh, isn't that kinda... weird? What? Well, it's not connected to the main computer, right? There's just this keyboard and the monitor. The only cable connected to this thing is the power cable we just plugged in. So why is it working? Maybe it's a wireless display. Clearly, this was a reasonable explanation to Lotus. A uh, wireless display? Yes, it connects to your computer wirelessly, hence the name. Have you been living in a cave, Junpei? He most certainly had not, but is that normal? Yes, at least where I worked. As they spoke, the lines of letters suddenly stopped and disappeared. The only thing left on the screen was the word pass, followed by a colon. It looks like we need to enter a password. Again. There must be a hint around here somewhere. Could you go take a look? Yeah, I'm on it. 
What are you gonna do? I'll see if I can do something about this on my own. On your own? Yep, on my own. Lotus pulled over the nearest chair and dropped herself down onto it in front of the keyboard. For a second, she stared at the screen. She kneaded her hands, knuckles popping, and twisted her back left and right. All right, let's kick some ass. Lotus smiled to herself and rubbed her hands together in anticipation. Then, before Junpei had time to blink, she was typing at an incredible speed, the click-clack of the keys running together like machine gun fire. Uh, what? Junpei was, for once, at a loss of words. Didn't expect that, did you? Of course I didn't. Lotus grinned, pleased with herself. Well, at any rate, that was pretty amazing. <laughs> Did you fall for me again? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean, again? Not into you. I know, I know. Don't be so stubborn, shy boy. Not being stubborn, I'm not shy. I'm not a, and I'm not a boy. I'm a young, healthy 21-year-old man. I could have fall for an old lady like you. Suddenly, the guttural roar of a furious animal filled the room. Or so Junpei thought for just a moment. Lotus's hand suddenly stopped and her shoulders stiffened. Old lady, did you just say, old lady? Ah, crap, thought Junpei. I went too far. Oh well, it was a nice life while it lasted. I've had enough of you. Go somewhere else. You're bothering me. What? Go see if you can find a password hint or something. I'll try and open this from here. You're distracting me. Go. Now. Lotus waved her hand in the universal gesture of dismissal. Junpei was clearly not wanted. Time to cut my losses, Junpei thought, and left as quietly as and inoffensively as he could. Junpei wandered around the room for a while looking for anything that might help find the password for the computer. Unfortunately... He found no clues whatsoever. Nothing. He asked Clover if there was anything useful in the laboratory, and her answer was no. Damn, he thought. Looks like we've hit a dead end this time. But just as he was about to tell Lotus that his search had re returned nothing. Alright! Bullseye! Junpei, I did it! Excited cheering erupted from near the monitor. He hurried back to find Lotus looking rather smug. She gestured for him to look at the screen, and he did. The strange text from before was gone, and its place was something entirely different. Nine squares arranged in a three by three square. What is that? I don't have any idea. It just showed up after I cracked the password. You think it's a puzzle? It certainly looks like one. As she spoke, Lotus stood up. Huh? Aren't you gonna, I don't know, do more computer stuff? I can't do any more. It won't let me do any more programming. See the keyboard. Nothing. So there's nothing more I can do. Um, well, I guess I'll just leave this to you then, Junpei. What? Let me take a break, all right? I did my part. He wasn't sure what to say to that. She, shouldn't, she certainly had done her part. In fact, without Lotus, they probably would have run completely aground. I shouldn't rely on other people so much, Junpei thought to himself. From here on out, he told himself he would rely on no one else. Junpei crossed his arms and stared at the puzzle shown on the screen. So, funny scene aside, this uh, should look familiar to you. This is the grid that we saw from Lotus, uh, not Lotus's, uh, Clover's hint earlier. So if you remember, one, bottom right is one, top right is two, top left is three, middle is four. All right, I solved it. Did you hear a noise just now? Yeah, I did. It sounded like something unlocking. Where did it come from? If you'll notice, uh, on the top screen there, on the right, these lockers, the uh, nine lockers on the right, were not open before. So if we go ahead and check them, look, Junpei, the lights on the locker are green. And then we must have unlocked it with the computer puzzle. And inside, we get keys. There's more than one key in here. This one is small and looks like it goes to some sort of machine. And this one has the Earth symbol on it. I think the Earth symbol matches a keyhole in the door on A-Deck. Well, if that's the case, we probably don't need the Earth key right now. Alright then, Earth key. I'll just tuck you away deep in my pocket. Now as for the other key... 
We can examine this one. What key is this? From the shape of it, I'd say it's not for a door. Probably some sort of device. Oh! What is it? I wonder, do you think maybe this is the activation key for that thing? The activation key? Yes, it has to be. I feel good about this. It looks like a key to, the, to activate something. So I actually haven't examined this yet. Oh, cutscene? Cutscene! It was just that at that moment that he heard a voice behind him. It was Clover. Hey Junpei, do you have a minute? He put the puzzle aside for the moment and walked over to Clover. What's up? Um, well, never mind. Hey, hold on a minute, what is... Sorry, just forget about it. It's nothing. Before he could say anything else, she spun around and ran back down the stairs. The hell was that? After waiting a few minutes to see if she would return, Junpei sighed, shook his head, and went back to searching. Hmm. So if we move right over here, I ha actually haven't examined this area too much except to get the uh, the uh, prong here. Also, according to the clock, it's uh, it's 12:25 right now, meaning we have less than six hours to get off the ship. Uh, if we look right over here, we have the area for the activation key. This key. The shape sure makes it seem like it goes to this machine. All right, I'm turning it on. Okay, the monitor is on now. And it's full of letters. It's showing some kind of warning. Power restored to experimental device. Emergency system will activate in the event of abnormal subject behavior. Okay. If we move back over here, there's one last uh, thing that we didn't examine over here on this side. Other than this mannequin right here. Is this like an examination table? There's a creepy mannequin in here, guys. I think there is some funny dialogue if you keep examining this mannequin. There's something sticking out of the mannequin's head, like wires or something. What the hell were they doing in there? Huh? Why is she all quiet now? They were doing experiments on humans, probably. Oh man, now she looks sad. Hmm? There's a mannequin lying on the exam table. I can't really see it very well from here, but it looks like there are a bunch of electrodes, electrodes sticking out of its head. There's a mannequin lying on the exam table. It's got a bunch of electrodes sticking out of its head. The mannequin looks so... sad. I've got to admit, I'm starting to feel kind of sorry for it. Am I getting attached to this thing? Maybe I should give it a name. How about... The Science Boy? Science Boy is lying on the table. His poor head is full of electrodes. And that's all, all we get out of Science Boy. Junpei, the thing in here is on now! Yeah, that's because we activated the power over on this side. Could you, like, play with it a little? Okay, yeah. I'll turn this dial here. Turn, turn, turn. Uh, I don't think it's working. Nothing's hap- nothing happened. Well, maybe she missed something. I should ask her to look around this room again. Maybe if you increase the voltage. Roger! Will do! Okay, I'm gonna go all the way to max voltage. M max voltage? Hey! Wait, Clover! Ah, oh, shit. What? Um, I think, uh... Oh my god! The mannequin's head! Oh man, that sounds like a fire alarm. G what the hell? Fire detected. Fire detected. The emergency system will be activated. Evacuate the room immediately. Science Boy's head is on fire. Science Boy! No! Oh, the humanity! What the hell is Science Boy? Are you... Are you talking to the mannequin? Yes. Forget about the mannequin! You need to help Clover, now! Science Boy's head is on fire. I feel bad for him, but he's already done for. I need to save Clover. With Science Boy's tragic death, we can now open up this door. Green light is on. Junpei, look at the light! Yes, it's green! The emergency system is activated and disabled the lock! Now we can save Clover! Junpei! Come on, kid. Jump! She's safe! Oh man, that smoke is, a, is some serious business. It's time to close the door again, I think. Clover! Are you okay? Are you hurt? <laughs> Damn, she's coughing so hard she can't even talk. 
Of course I'm not alright. What the hell took you so long, you big jerk? I was almost dead. S sorry, I was going as fast as I could. You two can do this later. Right now, we need to get the hell out of here. That fire's not going to stay in that room forever. And with that, we are going to go ahead and leave off this episode. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye!